Okay, well, let's make a start. So very warm welcome to everyone joining today. Really excited to have a very special guest, Tracy Young, who is the founder of PlanGrid, which basically builds software for construction companies. I was now um, on her latest venture, but PlanGrid was a pretty, pretty incredible story. If you haven't heard of it, they raised just $69 million, went through YC, and then was eventually sold for $875 million. So incredible story. And I thought how today's episode could play out. We'll go through the early days of PlanGrid, talk about all things product, growth, hiring, and then a little bit around the acquisition. And then we'll find out what Tracy is up to next. So Tracy, thanks so much for joining us. We always love having incredible entrepreneurs on the show. So uh, first of all, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Cool. Well, let's make a start. I'd love to find out more about your journey and how did you find your way into uh, the tech ecosystem, but also construction software? Um, I like building things. Uh, I was good enough at math. So studying engineering was the obvious choice for me. And I decided to really focus on construction. I think building buildings was very interesting to me at 20 years old. And so I graduated with an engineering construction management degree, and I worked as a construction project engineer on hospital construction projects. I did that for about five years and then started PlanGrid as a fun project with my friends. What was the initial product for those who don't know? Uh, the product in 2011, and it's still being sold today by Autodesk, uh, we digitized the construction record set. Uh, Steve Jobs announced the first generation iPad in 2010. My co-founders looked at each other and I looked at each other and we thought this is perfect for the construction industry. This is the first time you can bring a fully powered computer out into the job site. Um, oh, there's no software for it. Then let's, why don't we try to build software for it? Why did you want to go down the painful journey of starting your own company and not just work, you know, for a typical company and get a paycheck every month? <laughs> well, I didn't know it was going to be painful. Yeah. <laughs> so that was number one. Um, it was, again, a fun project that I got to work on with my friends. Uh, it was a tool that I wanted to use in the field as a project engineer, and it just seemed cool. Um, and then we started making real money, and then we started feeling the pain. And that's when I knew it was going to be a painful journey. Yeah. And this is back in the day, right, when the iPad wasn't really around. So how do you convince construction workers and teams to buy the product? Yeah, it was friction for sure. Um, you know, the, the initial people we went to, which were all my friends in construction, they're just like, this is cool, but I don't have an iPad, Tracy. And at the time, Apple had limits because they couldn't manufacture in them fast enough. So you'd go to an Apple store and they'd give you a four limit. You know, you can only buy four iPads. And so we would go from store to store in the Bay Area where we were living and max out our credit cards and... I mean, I don't, I don't recommend this to folks, right? <laughs> Maxing out your credit cards. And but we really believed in what we were building. And so we just loaned people iPads and gave them our software to use. Um, not many, you know, like 20 or something. And the hardest people to convince early on that this was a category in space were actually the VCs. And they were so naive about the industry, right? Of course, they just have nothing to do with construction other than their like fancy kitchen remodels. So the feedback from the investors like, oh, that seems like a good idea, but we don't believe that construction people could keep an iPad safe. They're just like, no, they, you don't understand. They go work in job sites in dangerous conditions and they go home safely to their families every day. They're not going to break the iPad. They're like, no, we think they're going to break every iPad that gets handed to them. And now, you know, fast forward to 2023, if you're working on a job site, you probably have some kind of tablet to do your work from. Mm. I guess you're going around in your early days, right? First of all, asking your friends if you'd use the product, but what was the first initial user who came from maybe a referral or direct? Because there's very different feedback, right? Coming from friends versus mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the first actual uh, customer. I, I would say that the first let's say 500 customers or 5,000 customers were two degrees away from the initial user base. And this is very natural in construction. There's natural virality that happens because it takes you on a hospital project. It takes 5,000 people over yeah. five years to build a project. So there's a lot of people coming and going. 
And you often, especially if you're, you know, a local regional builder, you might see the same people from your last job on this job. So there's a lot of sharing of tools. And I think for construction folks, you want to be, they love tools because so much of their jobs is using tools to build buildings and structures. And so Plan Grid was no different. I think in 2011, 2012, you, Plan Grid was so cool that you wanted to be the first person to show your friends right. that you have this new tool. And that really, then the word of mouth growth really, you know, we really benefited from that. Yeah. When in the journey did you really start to think we have something here? I think by the time we got to 10 million in annual recurring revenue, and you have to understand that it was less than two years before where we hit the 1 million mark. I think at that point, because of Mount, remember looking at like, okay, we've got a million in revenue. It's like, how are we gonna get to 5 million? We got there, then we get to 10 million. And I think it was around that point where I realized, wow, I think we can build a really big business with what we have here. And we just have to replicate because we were only in a few cities at that point. Um, mm. And so if we can just take what we did and expand it to the next 20 top metro areas in the US, I think we can grow faster and we were right about it. How big was your sales team at this stage? Around 10 million in a year, we were only five people in sales. Yeah. In fact, here was the first year we had quota carrying sales folks. Yeah. And so Plan Grid grew, right, to 450 people very quickly. How did the company dynamics change as you hired more people? Mm -hmm. Everyone that comes in changes culture a bit. I think culture yeah. is dynamic. Um, it felt like every six months we had to reorg, and this wasn't welcomed by the team. No one likes change, but um, that was necessary for our ability to stay productive. And we also made bad reorgs. Um, those were also painful. I think the most painful point was when we hit 150 people. It's something happens when you hit Dunbar's number and everything goes to chaos. Suddenly, just no one knows what they're doing. Like, how can that be possible? We're a bigger team. We should be producing more. And it's like, we're just slowed down to molasses. That was really confusing to me. But most of the reason for that was because we were new leaders. We had no idea what we were doing. We knew how to build a good product for the construction folks, but in terms of company building and culture building, this was something we were just winging mm. the entire time. I mean, we didn't have basic things like performance reviews in place. You know, the, the basic infrastructure of a company that matters to people, none of that was there. Yeah. How do you fix it? Um, have a great HR leader yeah. in the building, have a great HR partner who is helping us think through career development and the things that people care about. I think you have some quite key principles, right? I think maybe you integrated those when you reached 150 people, which allowed you to hire fast and fire quickly. What were those principles and why was it so important to, I guess, plan great success, right? I think I liked our core values at Plan Grid, but we didn't live by them. And that's the biggest difference between Plan Grid and Tiger Eye, the company I run today. Um, just to give you an example, we had a core value that's like, we're not going to hire jerks. It was actually, we're not going to hire assholes, but HR came in and was like, <laughs> you can't use that word. Yeah. Um, so we don't hire jerks, except that there were jerks, a few jerks in our company. And they were performing for the company. And so I kept them in the building. And what that signaled to the rest of the team was two things. One, if you just perform for Tracy, you can get away with murder. Two, those rest of those core values, it doesn't mean anything, right? And so um, that is definitely a big change that we've made in our new company, where we take our core values very seriously. In fact, you know, aside from our five core values, there's another document that says our commitments to each other. And it's so specific and people sign it. I mean, it's a specific, I'll give you one example. It's like, mm. I will not speak destructively behind someone's back. If I've gotten a problem, I'm going to go talk to them and know that we can have a respectful conversation. So like, if you don't follow these 10 commitments to each other, you're out of the building. And this is, it's really, really important to everyone at ah. Tiger Eye. What are some of the other examples of 
those commitments. I will walk it like I talk it. <laughs> Love it. Love it. How did you get, um, you mentioned you had some, you know, jerks working at Plan Grid. How do you have those really difficult conversations as we've got some founders here today, right? When you're building in the very early stages, is it a little bit scrappy? Is it a bit of a duct tape, just fake it kind of until you make it? And you're just trying to find the best talent, right? But it comes yeah. to a stage where maybe those people aren't right for the companies. Mm -hmm. How did you personally have those conversations with the people who are maybe no longer suited to working with you? I think it's important to point out that I didn't have a lot of those courageous conversations at my last company. It yeah. depends on the individuals and, you know, my connection with them. Um, today at Tiger Eye, the conversation that I would have if someone was truly being a jerk, you know, we, I wouldn't be the first one. I'm sure other people in the company would call them out first, but the conversation I would have is, Hey, the things you said in this meeting or your behavior can make others feel this way. Are you aware of that? You know, listen to them. And it's like, hey, you're kind of being a jerk here and it's making people feel bad. Are you aware of that? Oh, you weren't? Hey, I'm telling you now so that you're aware, so that you stop doing it because it's not cool. And hey, by the way, if this continues and it happens again, we have to talk about either parting ways because it's not, it's not cool. So these are the courageous conversations that I wish I had at Plan Grid more often. Yeah, connected to this, you know, especially in the early days of uh, founder starting companies, right? There are many ups and downs. And um, if you're happy to, you guys had quite a personal story, right? In the early days, you're going through YC, I believe, and that was the first couple of weeks. And very sadly, you know, one of your founders, um, co-founders passed away. Um, how did you manage to stay together and how did you all just huddle together and try to make things work? This is the hardest part about the startup journey because not only are you trying to do the hardest thing you've ever done before, something but that by all measures is impossible because most startups fail. Life doesn't stop just because you're trying to start a startup. Um, it, and this isn't unique to Plan Grid. It wasn't unique to us. Bad things happen all the time. People get sick. Everyone is aging. Um, and for Antoine, he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and he died at 29. This was, I mean, I, I probably still hold a lot of trauma, including my co-founders from this. We just took all of that pain and all of that hurt and we just poured it into the company because we didn't know what to do. And we told ourselves that we were going to build Plan Grid in memory of our best friend. And in, you know, it's now 11 years later, um, 12 years later, maybe. Um, yeah, I think thinking back, we probably just didn't know how to handle it, that pain. And so we ignored it and we kept building our startup. Well, he would be very happy, right? Uh, now, I think actually, I was, I was just thinking about that. I think yeah. Anton would be happy about it because I don't think he would have wanted any of us to, you know, slump into a tar pit of despair over him. He would have wanted yeah. us to keep living our lives. Yeah, and I can imagine it's really hard, right? You're trying to build a company, I guess, you and you were living together at this point, so I'm guessing you had care coming in to support him. Yeah, and we had hospice so care. Many... Isn't that crazy? We had hospice care coming into our hacker house because one of us was really sick. Mm. It's insane. So when in the plan grade journey did things start to change? You mentioned uh, 150 people, right? Uh, started generating 100 million, sorry, 10, 10 uh, million dollars in ARR. Um, what was the next phase of the plan grid's journey to try and get to that 100 million ARR? So it's totally possible to have finally find product market fit, and then to lose it overnight. Um, I think the success, the early day success of Plan Grid was um, becoming visible to a lot of people, including investors. And they started pouring a lot of money into construction tech. And so we're talking about overnight, probably close to billions of dollars being invested in construction tech startups. 
And many of them, the first thing they did was copy our product. And so we woke up one day with like 10 copycats that were cheaper on the market. It didn't work as well as ours, but it looked like ours. And so we knew we needed to move upstream towards the enterprise because we did great with like mom and pop construction firms. There's no IT, there's no red tape or just construction projects where they had their own construct, um, 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 budget silos. And we suddenly realized we needed to start deploying software at the top at headquarters. So it goes to every single project instead of tracking down every project at a time. Well, our product wasn't ready for that because the buyers at the corporate office want a different type of product. They don't want the product that the field uses. They don't go into a construction site. They want admin panels. They want dashboards. They want tools that help them track the usage of their field teams. And suddenly we're talking about having product market fit in the field, but zero product market fit for the buyer in the office. And those were, you know, building for the enterprise is hard. It um, requires a lot of stuff we didn't care about, <laughs> but we well, had to build the, it. Survive. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys raised so $69 million, right? Um, what was the hardest part of the fundraising journey and why did you guys want to raise money in the first place? I think that for a long time, we ran a profitable business. We raised a seed, a small seed round. Well, it wasn't small. It was like over a million dollars in 2011. So that's sizable. But we took that and we got to 5 million ARR and we were a profitable company. Um, and we wanted to do that forever, by the way. We just mm. wanted to run this profitable company without a board. The founders are there. We get to do what we want. And we'll just keep building awesome tools for the construction industry forever and make money while we're doing it. And then we realized that in B2B enterprise SaaS space, there is no lifestyle business. There's usually in a vertical for the construction industry, there usually is one behemoth of a winner that has most of the market share, then a second place with some of the market share, and then everyone else just waiting to run out of money. And we didn't want to be in that third category. Um, and so we had to fundraise because capital can do a lot. You can hire people, you can build more, you can take your product out to market, you can defend your own keyword. The amount of money we spent buying up plan grid from Google ads was insane because all our competition was buying up our keyword. And that costs money every single day, every yeah. single week. Expensive. Mm -hmm. You were doing this with your closest friends, right? How did you remain close friends? And it's really challenging, right? I mean, starting mm -hmm. a business with your closest friends is not the easiest. So how, how were you splitting up job roles? And just how did you, I guess, keep that really close friendship? Yeah, two questions there. So you want to make sure there's not too much overlap because there's too much to do. And we had five co-founders. And so someone's in charge, in charge of architecture, someone's in charge of the website, someone's in charge of native app, someone's in charge of HR legal, miscellaneous stuff, someone's in charge of sales and marketing. And that's how we split it up. Um, in terms of keeping a good relationship, um, this was an area I failed. I had good relations, it'd be rotating. I'd have good relationships with some of them and then bad relationships. And I would get angry about the most trivial thing because it's like high pressure, high strength, stress. And we were really young. You know, we started playing we in our twenties. And um, I would say that what has kept us together is you have to understand all of us were friends to start with, right? And some of us have known each other long, longer than others. And I think I think what kept us together in the worst moments is forgiveness. And I was I was the one who received that gift, right? Mm -hmm. I was the one who was walking around angry over nothing. And my co-founders really gave that to me an unconditional support of me as their co-founder and CEO. And I am forever grateful. And it's hard to do. Because mm. it was something that was very hard for me to do in my 20s. Much easier today just because, I don't know, I'm a mom or something. Yeah. What were the, some of those 
um what were some of those effects that made you unhappy i think that when you are moving at such a fast velocity in a startup it is very easy to have this tunnel vision where you are moving so fast, you're working so hard, and it's very easy to look at other people and think that they are not moving as fast as you and they're not trying as hard. And it's this very arrogant way of, of seeing the mm -hmm. world. And um, I think that's where a lot of the conflict comes from because startups have bad stuff going on all the time. Things are breaking all the time. Um, you never have enough resources. You have all this competition and... I think that it came from a place of arrogance. Yeah, this is very good. Um, so why don't we jump to 2018? I think you guys are now doing $100 million uh, in era. I think you have a team again of about 450 people. Uh, so building, you know, a pretty incredible software company, you decide to sell to Autodesk, right? Why was it the right time to sell? We hadn't hit a hundred million in 2018. I think we ended that year. It's, I'm, I'm dated now. It's been a few years since I thought about it, but shy of a hundred million. Um, we would hit it in Q1 of 2019. This doesn't matter. I don't know why I'm telling yeah. you this. <laughs> why don't we decide to sell? Um, there's, a, there's always a competitive factor to acquisitions. There, I was looking at number one and we, we were in the number two spot. I was looking at what we needed to do to catch up to number one, which was make our product enterprise ready, which we were a long ways from, broaden our platform, so take on more product lines because we were seen as a point solution in the market and somehow accelerate growth. In the end, I looked at myself and our team and with the capital that we had, and I didn't think, I, I saw risks in our ability to get there. It wasn't that I didn't think we could get there. There was risk and we need to execute flawlessly over the next four years. And the offer that Autodesk gave us was at a multiple that assumes we will execute flawlessly for the next four years. And so it was a good deal. And I had to remove myself from my own ego and what I thought was right for just Tracy and make the best decision as CEO and board director of Plan Grid. And I advise the whole board to sell the company. And that was hard because I had spent by this point my entire adult life working on Plan Grid loving plan grid my you know my whole life was there and mm. now I'm handing it over on a silver platter to our competitor yeah i was saying um before we went live we had a an incredible guest a couple of weeks ago david Hauser, who's the founder of uh grasshopper which was one of those virtual telecoms companies and again similar to your story he sold and the next day you're no longer known as tracy of plan grid you're just known as someone who works at plan grid right how did your motivation change once you had sold and, uh, you know, were you hungry to go and start another company? I was excited to join Autodesk. Once I made the decision, I just wanted to merge our products together, merge our teams together and go really compete in the market. Yeah. I could see us win the market, right? Um but I landed on the moon. I think founders make terrible public company employees. And it was just a complete mm. cultural clash. Mm. It felt like I had to ask five people for permission before I could even sneeze at the company. But that's just how things work. Because there's a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of people involved. And we need to make sure that we inform everyone so we make the best decision possible. Whereas at Plan Grid, it felt like, you know, it's like, okay, if something is wrong, we're just going to make a decision and try to fix it. We can always make another decision tomorrow if it was the wrong one. But that is not how public companies operate because first, there's a lot of people, there's revenue to protect. And then also they have to actually report their numbers to Wall Street every three months. Yeah. And I think that having to open up their data in that way 
is um and strategy in that way is very limiting yeah um, and it was hard yeah it's always really interesting to hear when acquisitions happen right and maybe a question back how how careful and selectful were you about choosing who you exit to and were there other offers on the table Oh, my board wanted me to shop Autodesk's deal around. They wanted me to talk to Oracle. They wanted me to talk to SAP and I refused to. It's like, it just doesn't make sense. Um, Autodesk is the leader in design software. Hmm. And for some reason it gets printed into blueprints. And then that's where Plan Grid come, comes in. We store all of that. We give them a lot of collaboration tools in the field to track their changes, et cetera. So their software is the beginning. It's the front end of what we ingest. There's natural technology synergies here. Um, the world is moving towards 3D design and this is something we wanted to build and it would take us longer, whereas we could leverage Autodesk 3D technology and jam it into our, our, our native software and take it out to market, right? So the Autodesk and Plan Grid partnership just made a lot more sense than any other companies. And I actually didn't talk to any of them because yeah. I, I didn't want to work for them. <laughs> I didn't want them to own our technology. It just didn't make sense. And I didn't think they would want to buy us anyways. Hmm. We have a great uh, question here from one of the founders who is asking, you have a family, I believe at this point also, and you've got the deal going on. How are you mentally staying, saying, staying stable? <laughs> uh, I think that's, um, you know, I think all founders are a little bit crazy. Um, mm. But yes, so at this point, as, as we're negotiating the deal and it took like a whole year, so I'm pregnant by that point, I, was, I already had our baby, um, so I had a newborn. How did I stay sa stable? Um, the usual tricks are suddenly unavailable to a woman when she is pregnant. Like I can't smoke, I can't drink. Um, so I walked a lot, <laughs> which seemed like an inferior substitution to contrabands, but, um, walking was really important for me, I think. Awesome. We have quite a few questions coming in, but, um, We'll probably go back to the, uh, we've got quite a few questions here around sales, which we'll go back to. But uh, after that long journey of Plan Grid, you're now back into the trenches of starting another company. Uh, if you're open to, we'd love to hear kind of what you're working on next and why do you want to go back into starting another company? Yeah. Um, lots of reasons. I I like working. My, I saw my parents work incredibly hard and it's made me who I am today. I love working with the team. Um, we are a small team of 25 people and most of them came from Planger. This is a hand-selected team from Ralph and I of the best people we've ever worked with. And we love building really beautiful software. We love inventing software to help people do their jobs. And the background here is we spent 15 months at Adidas and part of the work we did was integrate our startup into the public company and that includes systems integration. So we ditched all of the tools we were using to run our company and we adopted all of the winners, all of them. So all of the incumbent software, um, you know, we went from G Suite to Microsoft Suite, um, Salesforce, Workday, all of them. We were in, and what's really fascinating was seeing overnight this immune system response back from the team because now they are less productive. I mean, I even got questions like, why do I have to use these tools? Do you like, is that how little mm -hmm. you care about us that you're giving me literally the, the, ter the most terrible tool to do, do my job and work from? And they were angry. And here we are building beautiful software to help construction people do their jobs better. And it was an incredible inspiration for Ralph and I to build great enterprise software so that people can also do their, you know, be happy about doing their work from. And so Tiger Eye is still in self, um, so I can't say much about it, but we do help leaders track and predict the future performance of a sales team. So if you're a sales leader or if you're in revenue operations or if you're an executive of the company that cares about revenue, um, I'm, I'm totally happy to give you a demo and show you what we're doing. Just DM me. 
Is this your final software company? That's a good question, Ollie. Um, this is the last startup I'm doing. I'm going really? on the record on that one because it's hard. Hmm. I, I'll always have projects in my life, but if I am lucky at all, we get to work on this for 10 years. Hmm. But this is the last software company. I think I'm going to really? find out. <laughs> I'll call you in 10 years. And then, uh, <laughs> you might change your mind. But yeah. um, one, of the, one of the questions here from the founders, another great one, um, you know, it's really hard building a company, right? How did you relax during the journey of being a founder? Or you still are, right? So how, how are you relaxing day to day? And um, how do you just chill out? Man, you guys, I don't have a life. I just, I work on Tiger right. Eye. And um, oh, I do have a life. I have a very meaningful life. I have three young kids and that's all I do. I hang out with my three kids and I work on Tiger Eye and that is my life. Very good. Uh, another question here from one of our founders. Uh, how did you go about getting your first million dollars in sales? Um, and was it only through typical sales channels or did you have any uh, other strategies? Yeah. Uh, first million dollars, early days of Plan Grid. Um, this would have been like year one. We organized ourselves in engineering and operations. We're so proud about it. We called ourselves when we you're like, we're running our company like Star Trek, which doesn't work by the way, but it worked in that year. So we're only less than 20 people. So if you're in operations, you actually did everything that was not coding, including sales. We had a demo script that was only five minutes and Plan Grid's product had several wow moments. So you'd see it and, you know, construction folks job would drop. It was virgin control. That was the one I'm thinking about. And so everyone would be certified on the five minute demo script. So everyone was proficient in talking about Plan Grid and it was really easy to demo Plan Grid. And we would just show people. And at that time we were using GoToMeeting and, or if they're in the Bay Area, we'd go to their job sites and show their team. And that was it. And it was priced in a way, I mean, it was like in 2011, you know, you could buy Plan Grid for 200 bucks a year per person. And so people were just swiping their credit cards. And um, that's how we sold. We just brute force showed a bunch of people Plan Grid and then we made a million, our first million dollars. What were some of your favorite features? In those years, um, we had something called punch lists. In the UK, they're called snag lists. Oh. And it, they're basically deficiency. So you finish, you get close to finishing off the project and you would go punch in the US, we call it punching the building. So on the app, you would literally punch and take photos of the deficiencies or the defect and then type in some notes and then it would synchronize and then you'd be, you'd be able to create beautiful reports and hand it over to whoever you want. Um, that was one of my favorite features. And we had this, since it was called a punch list, it had this boxing glove icon, which we ended up having to get rid of when we went international because no one else in the world understood what that icon was. That's smart. So if you have tons of notes, right, and you remember a couple of words, maintenance or subscriptions or come up with the notes you had on the system? Yeah, yeah. it was uh, collaborative. You know, we, yeah. were tracking, we were tracking issues in the field. That was what yeah, we did. Yeah, I love that. Very cool. Um Okay, another question from the founders. Yeah, if you would start Plan Grid today, which geographies would you focus on? One more time, if I started Plan Grid today, which... Yeah, which geographies would you focus on? Countries. Oh, oh, oh. That's such an interesting question. Um, all the English-speaking countries first, because that is my language. Yeah. <laughs> Much easier as well. I mean, there's construction everywhere, right? Um, I think it, it does matter um, when I don't speak other languages. It just doesn't make sense to go there. You end up having to hire people who are local who speak the language and can market mm -hmm. to those geographies. Is um, This question is connected to what we spoke about earlier around um, having that support network, right? Apart from your founders who you were super close with, did you have founders outside the plan grid? And how did you meet them? What was that support network you had? Yeah, I have um, a small group of women who have all done very amazing projects. Some started companies, some run firms, VC firms, and we meet up twice a year. Mm. Um, we try to meet up more often, but we're all moms now and it's very hard to find time. Mm. And we're all 
everywhere else. Um, and this was my, this was my crew. Where did I meet them? I just, I met them at tech events, honestly, and mm-hmm. in Silicon Valley tech events, maybe it's true for the rest of the world. Most of the founders don't look like me. And you're at some event and here's someone who's like, oh my God, you're also building a company and you kind of look like me. Mm. Um, naturally, it's just, you know, you gravitate towards them and you realize there's actually a lot in common. And the next step is just like, hey, I love this conversation. Will you, can we continue it? Will you have coffee with me sometime? And mm. that's how I built these relationships with my friends who are also doing the same thing as me. Yeah, And I think I... it's really, really important because of course I have other friends, but the challenges of building a startup is so specific that, you know, it's, it's only other founders who understand why it's painful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is how you find great mentors, right? And one of the questions here is what is the greatest piece of advice you have received from one of your current or previous mentors? Gosh, I've received so much advice over the years. Um, this is not advice. This is advice quoted from Jack Welch, who is, um, he's now rest in peace. Um, he was CEO of GE for many years. Um, he says, face reality as it is, not as it was or how you wish it to be. And this is my mantra in life now that Bad things, of course, happen, but, you know, and we have to let ourselves go through the emotions of these bad things, but there's really, it's not productive to linger on them. Is there lessons learned here? If there's not, we just Mm -hmm. have to face reality now as it is because nothing else is real. We can hope, you know, of course we can hope for a better reality, but the only leverage we have is to work towards that reality that we want. We can't wish it to be something else that doesn't do anything. We can't wish it to be like the past. That also doesn't do anything. I hope hope that will be useful to you. Yeah, look forward. Um, Wow, okay, a lot of questions. Founder relationships, we briefly discussed this earlier, but maybe this is a good time to ask about your current company, right? Um, Who you're starting with your um, former founder at PlanGrid, but also your husband, right? What key aspects do you have between each other, which make a long lasting relationship, but also a co-founder friendship? Mm. God, it's such a good question. Um, Let me think about this for a second. I think it's really, really important to be able to have the hard conversations. I think Ralph will probably be, would say otherwise, just because I'm always pushing for the hard conversations. Um, it's just like, get off my back on that. Um, but what you don't want is to have problems linger, problems that are in your personal lives or problems in your professional life. And you don't want them to sort of mix up. Um, but it does because I live with my co-founder and we raise three kids together. Um And so there has to be a lot of communication that can be hard because there's so much to do and we're all trying to put out fires in our own ways. Um, I think it's really, really important that we assume by default that we're each coming from a place of care, that if we're frustrated about something or we're angry about something, that those emotions, those negative emotions, we actually can't get rid of, but we can shorten those, the duration of those emotions, but also assume that there is like care and love and good intent behind everything we're doing that we just want the best for our children we just want the best for Tigray. you have strict boundaries so when you are both back in the house no more work post 7 8 p.m or you we both just always working it just we doesn't talk about work all the time but when we are really stressed out one of us will say can we talk about that tomorrow I can take on that conversation right now. And then it's a hundred percent respect of that yeah. ask. Yeah. Very good. Um, maybe two more questions. And uh, we have a lot. Um, one question here is okay, if you could go back to day one of starting Plan Grid, what is the one thing you wish you had known? I wish. 
that we had the courage to run faster. We had created this category of field construction software. We invented it. And because of slow execution, we lost our position. And it was because we didn't have the courage to run faster. Because we didn't fundraise. You know, in the years that we were profitable, there's three years in there that we could have raised from VCs, grew a sales team, taken it out to market internationally. And I think that would have been a different, I might still be running the company today, right? Yeah. If your co-founder and partner, Ralph, was to describe you to someone, um, a founder or a friend, how would he describe Tracy? He calls me a warrior poet. I love that. (laughs) I love that. Um, Okay. I think we have answered pretty much all questions. Well, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, And maybe one question to, to finish off, you know, you've built one, incredible company already what's the big moonshot goal now for tiger eye i just want to see if we can make a few less mistakes we made a lot of mistakes at plangard and now we're curious about it what if we didn't make those mistakes could we build a better company Mm. and i'd like to see that through awesome well many of our founders have said thank you so much as well and uh massive thank you from us as well here at antler and really excited to see where tiger tiger eye goes next and yeah we can't wait and um big thanks again for joining us and we can't wait to catch up soon no thanks for coming here to listen to me monologue at you so have a good night guys awesome thank you so much have a good time guys bye thanks